All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Uh, you might notice a slight dis difference in today's video, and that is because I have I've had a DSLR camera, a couple of them for my studio recordings, and I have attached that to the computer uh, like a webcam. So if in the middle of the talk, the, the camera goes dark, please uh, don't mind. I will come back live with my computer's camera. And uh, similarly, if there is any other quality issues today, uh, please forgive me. So with this, let's start. We would continue to uh, discuss the open forum that we started yesterday. There was a lot that we had to do, and we kind of stopped in the middle, which tells me how much interest is present and how many questions were present on the live side as well. So just to keep you oriented, this I'm looking at you in the camera, and here is my computer setup, and here is the, the, uh, the chat. So when I'm looking away on this side, I'm looking at the chat. And here is the drawing uh, system. So when I'm looking at this side, I'm actually looking at the drawing or the references that I'm presenting. And today is the first day that I am um, relaying live on Periscope as well on Twitter. I have no idea if Periscope allows longer videos. I have no idea how would they show up on Twitter. So if anybody is on Twitter and you are watching it, please tell me how does it look. So with this, let's start. Welcome to everyone. Our favorite show continues uh, again today. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> Kathleen says, Dr. Bean, how are you? Doing good. How about you, Kathleen? Um, Margaret McKinnis, good evening. Dr. Bean, sir, from Maine. Good evening. Mar Margaret, hope you're doing great. Um, and good evening to everyone. There are so many folks. There are actually folks on Twitter as well today. So that is interesting. Um, Cool. So let's start. So once again, please, if you can do it, uh, please uh, put a question mark or the word question or a letter Q with your question. So when I'm looking at the comment feed, I can look through that and see and check your questions or pick your questions. Uh, I want to continue with the Twitter questions as well. So let me start our screen share. And we'll go from there. So this is drbean.com. So one way to support us is also to go uh, and buy a plan if you like. Usually we just upload these videos to drbean.com as well. This is the Twitter thread. Yesterday we had reached this far. So I left it open here and I would continue from here. Uh, there are some links as you can see here. These links are related to the answers that I would be um, offering with these questions. So let's start. Hopefully, you're all doing good. So the first question here, continuing from yesterday, Henry Fortune says, please consider this effect of ivermectin on male fertility and its interaction. So here is that study. <clears throat> so the, the, the concept here is that effect of ivermectin on male fertility and its interaction with P glycoprotein inhibitors, verapamil in rats. So we know that verapamil is used for um, certain purposes. The important thing here, um, Henry, is that at least in this data, I'm not seeing any um, dosage for the ivermectin. So I had to actually look up, download the actual PDF, look up the dosage itself to see what was the dose. Was it therapeutic or not? And secondly, this is something that is observed in mice. Uh, is it is it applicable to humans or not? So I have to do some more digging to answer this one. Uh, positive news. What is driving severe response in some young male males still? Are we still? So we talked about that yesterday. Uh, Abdullah Hussain, Dr. Bean, can you please discuss the effect of ibuprofen on vaccine? So the, this seems to be a new comment in here. So Abdullah, I have talked about ibuprofen in the past as well. Now the question you are talking about is the effect of ibuprofen on vaccine. As some studies showed, it reduces kids' vaccine efficacy. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to keep it once again focused on the SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Because SARS-CoV-2 vaccines 
are not um, uh, allowed or tested on kids, although Pfizer's vaccine has been tested, but the number has been smaller. So we would skip this question for this part. And maybe when we talk about vaccines in general, we can talk about it. Generally, just know this that any, any anti-inflammatory that is given while you're giving vaccines, which are going to try to cause inflammation, can have a, a small suppressive effect, but that should be very tiny. Priya says, do you think that the vaccination is safe for people who have uh, CFSME? Uh, so that is chronic fatigue syndrome and myeloencephalitis. So I have a couple of... Uh, things over here. So I'll have to figure that out where it is. So I just opened those links again, and maybe these are missed. So anyways, let's answer this one. There is, uh, Priya, I have a link here. Actually, let me find it. It is going to be important here. So here is a link for the CSF ME Association or CFS uh, ME Association. So according to them, so again, we're talking about chronic fatigue syndrome, myeloencephalitis, which may be because of a vaccine or it may have occurred because of a past uh, cancer therapy or it could have occurred because of a past uh, viral infection. And then the result is that the person gets into a chronic fatigue-like thing, the muscles aches, and, and there are lots of such neurological symptoms as well. So from this society, what they are saying is the following. The safety data so far on all three vaccines indicates that they all have a potential to cause short-lived side effect. So because the CFS and SME are related to some sort of an immune system, they are saying that please keep in mind that number one, giving vaccine to anyone, healthy person, is going to cause a potential short-lived side effect. Then they say that it is possible that they this might trigger the CFS ME, but for a short period of time, and it would go away. So if you see here, they say that there is a definite risk of some ME CFS symptoms being exacerbated. Why? Because we're going to poke the immune system. We are going to make it a little bit mad. So when it is going to act, then the other immune system dysregularities that are present, that might get poked as well. A much lower risk of a more significant exacerbation. So they feel that from the data, they don't feel that there is going to be a lot of exacerbation. The possibility that once very large numbers of people have been vaccinated, we will learn more. And they're saying that we do not have enough data. A fairly high degree of protection from COVID is important as well. So what they're simply saying is that it is possible that a patient of CFS ME might become a little bit more uh, sick for a few days but it is life protection as well. So that is the trade-off. Then we have uh, our Latina. Can you discuss elevated interleukin-2, interferon gamma, rantes, IL-6? Can, how can residual inflammation account for continued symptoms in long haulers, asthma, headaches, etc.? Is Maraviroc suggests suggested to act like lironlimab to lower the rantes and IL-6, what type of low-dose steroids have been effective? So <clears throat> this is one area that, where we are still uh, stuck as doctors, medical community, uh, that people who are experiencing long hauling symptoms, they continue to experience that. My So let me put these patients in three categories. One is a COVID patient who is aggressively treated early, and usually they do not become long hauler. That is one. Second is that those COVID patients who may have, for example, CFSME before, and now they, they have a COVID symptom or COVID disease as well, that kind of just triggers that. And the third one is the actual long hauling due to COVID. And that in itself is further divided into many reasons. I'm just going to stick to one reason, at, two reasons at this time. One is that possibility of the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 living in us for longer period of time. For example, we talked about this with Dr. Bruce Patterson, and he said that it is possible that SARS-CoV-2 continues to live in monocytes. So let me draw that to explain it. 
So what happens is from our bone marrow. So let's say if I make a bone, um, let's say we make a femur. So this is a femur. And although femur is not the most important bone, um, blood making bone, we have flat bones or the vertebras or the ribs and sternum, they, they make more bones. Anyways, a femur does that too. So, so let's say we have this bone over here and this is making blood cells. One of the important blood cell here is the um, monocyte. Monocyte is a cell that gives rise to, so it enters the bloodstream, moves around, has, has some fun, and finally it gets out of the bloodstream and takes residence inside the tissues. Once it's, uh, it's inside the tissue, it is called a macrophage, macrophage, or a dendritic cell, dendritic cell. Now, it is possible that the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, hangs around in the monocytes. And that causes a long hauling. But the thing is this, monocytes usually have short life as well. But when they become macrophages, when they get into the tissue, they can live there for a long period of time. So if somehow the virus has figured out a way, so this is a speculation here. This is not the scientific proved part. So imagine if the, the virus has figured out a way to go and infect our bone marrow. And in there, whenever a new monocyte is made, new copies of the virus are made as well. So then every new monocyte that is coming out contains the viruses. And when it goes to the tissue and it becomes active, it contains the viruses already. And that may be causing inflammatory responses. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that the virus itself continues to hang around in the gut tissue, for example, where we know that it hangs around for a long period of time. And from there, it keeps poking the immune system. A third possibility is that the immune system, remember when we talked about it in the past, we have the innate arm, correct? In the innate arm, we have macrophages, we have dendritic cells, we have neutrophils, we have natural killer cells, and so on. So we have some cells there. Then those innate arm cells, they activate the adaptive arm after about 10, 15 days, correct? And the adaptive arm, we know that we have a naive T cell that connects here. And then naive T cell would cause T helper 2 activation or T helper 1 activation. And then that would cause B cell activation or cytotoxic T cell activation. Correct? Again, I am brief here because we have talked about this, I think, many, many times. Now, in this whole process of activation, Eventually, what happens is that once the adaptive arm has become active, it will cause amplification of the innate arm. And that is where, for example, interferon gamma is interesting. Because interferon gamma release from the adaptive arm causes the innate arm to become active. On the other hand, from the innate arm, from this arm, there is continuous cytokines given, for example, interleukin-12 or other interleukins. And these guys kind of keep amplifying each other. They keep winding up each other and keep attacking the system. At the same time, when this is happening, there are regulatory cells. There are regulatory cells, immune cells that are also activated. And their function is to quiet down the immune system after some time. So they allow of the fight to continue for some days. They allow the inflammation to occur for some days, and then they stop this whole show. There is a possibility that the immune system's regulatory arm, which is part of the adaptive arm, forgets or is not able to stop both the parties from amplifying each other. So this is like a boxing match going on and they're not able to stop that match. And if that happens, then the immune system would almost become autoimmune disease. I am using this term loosely here, and then that would continue to cause damage. So what they have found is that interleukin-6 is present. Interleukin-6 is released by macrophages. It is released by many other cells as well. 
interleukin-2 is present, which is also released by macrophages and other. Interferon gamma is present, which is mostly released by T helper 1. And then other cytokines are present as well. Now, various drugs, for example, erolimab or others, can be used to suppress a part of this whole system. But what I have seen is that giving steroids, giving steroids that would suppress the whole system plus suppress the inflammatory wing, which is a separate system, it suppresses both systems and allows relief. And then um, in Dr. Patterson's words, that low dose therapy has to continue for some months before the whole cycle stops. And if we don't stop it, then ideally the immune system would start becoming energetic. So energetic means, so the word is energy, A-N-E-R-G-Y, A-N-E-R-G-Y, not E-N-E-R-G-Y. And energy means that immune system becomes tuned out for some pathogens or some issues. It says, you know what, I have responded to this thing enough. I'm not interested anymore to react to it. That is called energy. And so after months and months, energy would develop as well, and the patient would actually start recovering. So that is one. The other possibility is to suppress things like interleukin-6 and see if that helps to recover. Some people have said, like yesterday I was uh, seeing here, Tony was saying that uh, ivermectin has been very useful, or, or ozone therapy has been very useful, or thymosine 1-alpha, which actually increases the T helper cells and T cells, that has been very useful. So there are certain therapies. My, um, my experience has been steroids have been low dose steroid pulses have been the most useful. And I really empathize with the situation with the long haulers because there is no decent science that is coming forward. So Sean Dickman says, how do they make the messenger RNA for the spike protein to put in the nanolipids? So uh, Sean, the, the way this whole thing, of course, I'm going to just give you a general idea. So what happens is that we know for the SARS-CoV-2, the whole genetic, um, genetic map. And in that map, we know that from which base or nucleotide. Nucleotide, you can think of that as a brick in the wall of the genetic material or one letter in the recipe of the genetic material. So there are many, many nucleotides. And we know that there is a certain start and end of the nucleotide number where there is the genetic material for the spike protein. So once you know that, and we know it, you take this part and that becomes your messenger RNA. Now, the problem is to make it into a messenger RNA, you want to treat that. And the reason for treatment is this. You don't want to take the whole SARS-CoV-2 genetic pattern and inject that because that will make viruses and we don't want them. So what you do is as you slice out this part of the spike protein recipe, so that is like if you take the book which makes SARS-CoV-2 and you just tear out the page that makes a spike protein or the fried chicken part of it, then you have to convert that into a legitimate messenger RNA. And we have done that discussion before. You create some three UTR pieces. So you add some bricks in the beginning. You add some bricks at the end. Then you add a capping material. And we know what these materials are made up of or what are their genetic models. Then you add a poly A tail, poly A tail. And this all, when put together, becomes a legitimate messenger RNA, which can then be injected into our cell. And our cell would recognize that as a correct messenger RNA and then use it and work on it. Now the question is, can, how do we make copies of this? So we can make copies of it just like RT-PCR does. It amplifies the pieces of RNA. Similarly, we can actually do these copies by bacterial recombination or many other ways are present to make duplicates of these messenger RNAs. Once those duplicates are formed, they are then mixed with the lipids and the lipid nanoparticles are formed. And then these are the ones that become the vaccine. So very high level, but this is the general idea. How is the online thing? How, are the, how is the live site doing?
yeah, Nina is uh, so Nina, very sorry about that, and hope you feel better soon. Um, so I don't see a lots of question yet on this side. So I'm going to continue with the um, with the uh, Twitter. So that is uh, hopefully Sean that helps. Then there is a question here from I believe this part is the same. Michelle Devine says, "Is the vaccine safe? Good idea for long haulers." So the uh, Pfizer's. I still remember that I had read somewhere for Pfizer that they had given it to long haulers and they thought it had helped. Although when somebody, I believe Tony had Anthony Karalikas, uh, he had asked me to, can I find it? I could not find it from that document. So maybe I read it somewhere else. So generally, let's think about it for a second. Long hauling, if that is happening because there is an immune system disturbance, then giving the vaccine would actually trigger it even more and not help the long hauler. On the other hand, if the long hauling is because our own immune system is unable to mount enough of a uh, response to combat the virus, or the virus has gone and hidden in some monocyte-like cells, then giving one more tiny part of the vaccine may not actually help. So I don't feel, this is my opinion from the technical side of it, I don't feel that long haulers would benefit from the vaccine. On the other hand, if we feel, and uh, I'm going to answer, I'm going to contradict my own statement that I'm going to make. If we feel that somehow a person's immune system was not started enough by the virus, and we need to give the vaccine to kind of jumpstart it or trigger it or boost it, then vaccine may be useful. So now let me contradict my own statement. The virus is more potent than the vaccine. Virus has the machinery to replicate and divide and go into other cells and spread in our body and cause a lot of immune system damage. Or not damage to the immune system, but damage that immune system doesn't like and reacts. A tiny amount of vaccine may not actually be able to achieve a better goal than the virus itself. So um, I think that it is not much use. But if I go back to data, so you would always get two answers from me. One is from the technical or the scientific part. And the second is from the data part. So if I go back to the data, uh, Pfizer or Moderna do not have the data of showing efficacy for long haulers. So here is uh, Dallas for life. Replying to Dr. Bean, medical, I did my part to crush COVID, getting vaccinated. Excellent. Love it. Congratulations. So that is from Yale New Heaven Health. Excellent job. And Paul Wolf says, for some reason, your Twitter message was partially censored. I had to click on the warning message. It happens sometimes even my own messages show up as censored, and then I have to click them to see them. Eagle Eye, do you possibly think ivermectin can affect efficacy of viral vector vaccines like Oxford vaccine, even though they are non-replicating since there are so many modes of antiviral activity. So we talked about that yesterday as well. Just a quick reminder here. The question is that if somebody is taking, taking ivermectin, will that combat or resist or reduce the efficacy of the uh, vaccine itself? So we talked about that yesterday in context of uh, hydroxychloroquine as well. So the, and then we talked about ivermectin too. We know that when ivermectin is in our body, this is the ivermectin man, <coughs> excuse me. So today Luffy kept sitting in my chair for a very long time and I had turned the filter off to sit here afterwards and prepare. So it is irritating my throat. So let's say here is the ivermectin. I'm, I, mentioned it yesterday, ivermectin's job is to prevent the SARS-CoV-2, the virus cargo, or the, the small enzymes produced by the virus, which virus wants those enzymes to go into our nucleus and tell our nucleus, so these small cargos of the virus, 
need to go into the nucleus to reduce the cellular defense by telling the nucleus not to function to defend. This viral cargo is taken into the cell by a couple of proteins that I always call them as donkeys. They are the important A and B or alpha and beta. These importins take the cargo from the virus and bring it into the nucleus. Then that message from the virus, the enzyme from the virus goes to the nucleus and tells the nucleus not to defend. And ivermectin disrupts this process. So virus cannot send messages to the nucleus to say, please don't defend yourself and just die. Now, imagine we have given a vaccine and ivermectin is present. When the vaccine is brought into our cells, let's say there are two types of vaccines, adenovirus vaccines and the messenger RNA vaccine. When the messenger RNA is brought in, that RNA is directly fed into the, the ribosomes, which will make the spike proteins from it, which will be then presented onto the surface and the immune response would start. In this whole chain of activity, there is no function of ivermectin. Ivermectin is not going to do anything there. So messenger RNA vaccines, ivermectin won't do anything. Then let's talk about the adenovirus vaccine. In case of adenovirus vaccine, we have an adenovirus particle which contains the genetic material for the, for the spike protein. And we have done that discussion many times now in the last few days that eventually the adenovirus particle is going to connect with the nucleus and inject the DNA directly into the nucleus. There the DNA would make messenger RNA and that messenger RNA would, would go out to the ribosome and the ribosome will make spike proteins. Spike proteins will be presented on the cell surface and the immune system response starts. In this process as well, ivermectin cannot do anything because ivermectin is not able to stop a adenovirus from connecting to the nucleus. This is why ivermectin is not a general antiviral for every virus. So normal common cold viruses cannot be taken care of by ivermectin because their mechanism of action is different. The coronaviruses can be affected by ivermectin because their specific mechanism of action is impacted by ivermectin. So I hope that clarifies that the adenovirus vaccine or messenger RNA vaccine will not be affected by ivermectin. Ivermectin does have an anti-inflammatory role as well, which would cause the reduction in inflammation. That doesn't matter. We actually do not want inflammation from the vaccine. We want the immune system to get trained. So ivermectin, once again, will not affect. How is the, how are the things here? So let's see. So there is a question, zigzag. I've read some articles that long haulers are deficient in NAD plus depletion. Can supplementing niacin can help? Absolutely. Look, so what we do not have in terms of studies is what exactly is the issue that causes a person to become long hauler? Is it the less vitamin D? other supplements, a more potent immune system, or a way for the virus to enter the bone marrow and start becoming part of the monocytes, or their immune system, a person's immune system has a tendency to be dysregulated and not calm down. Because we do not know those things, there are many factors that will be involved. This may be one of the factors as well. <clears throat> So I'm very curious at how does this look on Periscope? Um, Denise, thank you very much. So Denise says, I agree with Doc about vaccines and long haulers. If you hear, hear these sounds, these are Luffy and Kyrie running around. So this is an inter interesting question. Ogadil Ogadil says, how does autoimmune diseases affect all of the body if COVID sick. So if I am trying to understand the question, you're saying that if somebody has COVID, 
and they also have the autoimmune disease, what would happen to the autoimmune side? So generally, when you have COVID, the immune system is going to respond. And so when you boost the immune system, if it is already dysregulated, it is going to cause a little bit of a damage. So um, normally, autoimmune disease patients have some drugs that they're taking to suppress the immune system. So if they've kept the immune system in balance with their drugs, then SARS-CoV-2 is just going to be acting normal, but it would have a tendency to cause immune system to be boosted if they're not taking medicine. That's one. Secondly, we know that those folks who are hypersensitive, that is also an immune system issue, they can actually develop severe reactions. So yes, autoimmune diseases or hyper uh, allergic folks do have a risk of immune system reacting more than others when the vaccine is given. <clears throat> so this is a very good question. Sumna says, I have autoimmune diseases in my family, including me. The doctor who died with the ITP is something my sister had. Why people with autoimmune diseases are prioritized for getting vaccines? So the people with immune uh, immunosuppression are prioritized. People with autoimmune diseases are not prioritized. They are taken as general population. This doctor or other doctors or nurses, they are generally prioritized because they are the first uh, tier of the people who are receiving the, um, the uh, vaccine. So nice question. Manafi Du says, is it ethically OK to vax young, healthy people as no long time safety is proven and there is ivermectin to treat? A difficult question because ivermectin is not generally available in all countries. For example, we have so much problem here in the US. So if ivermectin is available, interestingly, um, ivermectin's frequent dose is also not proven. It three months, six months, year once in three or six or a year is used, but giving it every week, like I do, these dosage and the results are not actually very much proven. They're not studied before. So I have a tendency to protect young people, and I know that vaccination helps a lot. So I personally am of the opinion to vaccinate. At the same time, the vaccination cannot be done for lesser than 18 or 16, depending upon which uh, vaccine uh, vaccine is used. But yes, if somebody, um, if somebody is young, they could be without vaccine and possibly be okay. But it is difficult for me to put that out because there is a risk in there. OK, so back here. This is a very good question here by Emily Ramsden. So she says that, question, I live in England, and today there's been 1,325 deaths. Sorry about that. Uh, US is doing horribly as well, 4,000 deaths, I think, a couple of days ago. I am unsure if they are giving ivermectin here or not. What advice would you give our medical teams if you could? Thank you, doctor. So of course, uh, my basic advice is I've written it down over here. So here is how, when I look at things, here is how I think about them. And I may be wrong, but on the social side, of course, masks, physical distance, exercises, yoga and other light exercises that allow the natural killer cells to increase in number. Uh, more light mood. So maybe that is with the comedy programs or that is with talking with your friends, whatever makes you happy. It is essential at this time to become happy. Top it off that at this time we are stuck in our homes. We are not able to go out. So we are generally uh, almost um, trapped in our homes for a long time. So it is important to somehow figure out ways to lighten your mood 
so that our natural killer cells can be boosted. I've done this discussion in the past that when we are stressed out, the stress hormones, adrenaline and others, they actually suppress the production of natural killer cells and function of natural killer cells. That actually puts us at a risk of responding incorrectly to the infection. So light exercise, some way to stay happy. Then um, financial help. One big cause of this issue, the stress, is the financial uh, issues as well. I see so many restaurants that are closed. I see so many folks who do not have their, um, their finances in order at this time. So financial help is very important at this time as well. I believe it is even more important than spending billions of dollars on uh, uh, vaccines. We can probably have things like ivermectin and provide financial help to those who, who need it. And then that should help as well. Then I am a proponent of no schools. The uh, reason is that schools and colleges allow the youngsters to go there and then they pick up the virus and they bring it back and then they can cause others to become sick as well. The death rate is low in children. That still is unacceptable. So I and children normally are not part of the socioeconomic cycle. They can sit at home and study and their schools and colleges could still get the fees from them. So why do you have to or why do we all have to expose our children? Uh, and then uh, one more thing, I think when I will say this, I'll get some uh, heat with this, but reduced interaction with those who are anti-vaxxers or who are anti-maskers. And again, I'm not um, bad mouthing them here, but somebody who does not wear a mask, they are risking themselves and they would risk others. Similarly, somebody who does not want to be vaccinated for whatever reason, uh, I'm not going to argue the reasons, but it is possible that they would become a vector for the virus for you. So that is the social side. Then over the counter things, vitamin D, I've done this discussion and I'm reading it from my list over here. Vitamin D, vitamin K2, calcium, magnesium, B1, zinc, quercetin, melatonin. Uh, uh, I've done these talks in the past. Then on the medical side, something like eye mask plus, so that is where ivermectin, aspirin, and other such drugs are important. Ivermectin prophylaxis, I wish that we had worldwide ivermectin prophylaxis, and it would have been so much better. So that is how I would approach any uh, area, may that be UK or US or other countries. Margaret says, thank you for your uh, gracious reminder. Dr. Bean, sir, thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, then we have Norman Kelly says, great news obtained ivermectin by a wonderful doctor at a very reasonable price to the di directory of doctors prescribing, which you can find on the FLCCC site. So that is a good news that there are many sites now, including FLCCC, uh, which list those doctors that are open to using ivermectin. So Dr. Sayed Heather, fourth down, you must use his link directly to have him then push health 24 states. And then Laura says, they're good. I've used my push health in nor call. Melissa Shipman, PA sent scripts right to your own pharmacy, much more convenient and more importantly, paid for covered by my insurance. So I think this is an important thing that there are doctors who are offering ivermectin. And I hope these doctors are protected from any heat because what they're doing is the right thing. Carlos Ortiz says, I think vitamin D accumulates in fat. If someone is taking vitamin D supplements and is slightly overweight, is there a risk of vitamin D overdose if supplements are continued and the person starts losing weight? So the um, very simple answer, <clears throat> if you have actually started to lose weight, and there is vitamin D, let's say, uh, by you, I, I mean anyone who is losing weight. That could be me as well. Um, I have actually gained a little bit of weight during this time. So let's say we have some fat cells and the fat cells have the vitamin D in them. And now the fat cells are going to go and shrink. That means they may eject their components, including the vitamin D. 
our body is very, very adapted to vitamin D. It can very rapidly remove it. So there is not much of an issue unless there is a drastically fast, rapid uh, reduction in uh, body levels and there is a lot of vitamin D that is uh, brought out, which I don't think would happen. So I don't think that there is a lot of uh, risk there. OK, so let's see here. Uh, <clears throat> Lori says, question, Dapsin has been added to some patients in the hospital. I'm not understanding the mechanism of action or it is advisable. Lori, how about I take that up as a separate topic as well? There are some, some things that, are, that need a little more discussion. So I'll take it up separately. Um, interferon is secreted by cells. Do you have link for CFS and vitamin D3, please? So that is a discussion going on here. <clears throat> Is there anyone from Paris, Periscope? How is it going on the Periscope? Uh, <clears throat> so Sonia says, I'm feeling generally not well daily. Tested positive on 928. Pulse of 15 milligrams a day or 10 milligrams once a week. Other things I can do. So Sonia, I have discussed this uh, uh, idea of what is the steroid pulse. This is what I have been doing. So let me give you two answers here. Number one, the delta cotrill, delta, this is what I do for my patients. Delta cotrill, five milligram. What I do is, let's say, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six. For the first two days, I give it morning, lunch, and dinner. Morning, lunch, dinner, five milligram each. So that makes a total of 15 milligram. Then the second two days, I give morning and lunch, five milligram and five milligram, and I skip the dinner. So that is 10 milligram. And then another two days, five milligram each in the morning. So that is what I do. It is actually a very tiny pulse. Dr. Patterson said that it may be that a smaller dose, for example, 5 milligram per day or 10 milligram per day, needed for weeks and months. So he has a slightly different uh, way of uh, thinking about it. I use this pulse. So arts lover, New York City. Question, is it safe to get the vaccine while the patient is COVID positive, asymptomatic? It is safe. If you can handle COVID, vaccine is nothing for you. Vaccine is what? It is the spike proteins of the COVID. And if somebody has the actual COVID and they are handling that COVID, then vaccine is going to be nothing. So Rob Castle says, Dr. Sayed, how much would you would much appreciate your medical view of waiting three months for a second dose of Pfizer or even Moderna vaccine? How fast does the body's BNTs forget and what the efficacy really means? So Rob Castle, very good question. Um, I have done this discussion. I was actually thinking to do this as one unit as well. So let's look at it. Look, so let's say here is a dose one. And in case of AstraZeneca, they already say that we are good for four months, to four weeks to three months. This is more for Pfizer and for Moderna that have not been tested that way. So a simpler answer from a testing and data point of view is not right. Don't do it because data doesn't show it to be. They haven't tested it this way. They haven't trialed it this way. So that is the data answer. Technical answer is the following. When you get vaccine on day one, it takes anywhere from seven days to 20 days, 21 days or more to start building antibodies. Now, the process of building antibodies contains the B cell uh, activation and B cell proliferation and then for making of the memory B cells. So what happens is, that here is a B cell. Let's say this is the B cell that is going to work against this vaccine. And we have, or that is going to become um, 
that would be able to take care of the SARS-CoV-2 because this vaccine is teaching this B cell to work. So what happens is B cell will become activated, then it will proliferate. Proliferate means it will make its copies, and then it would start releasing antibodies. Now, if the smaller dose is given or the first dose is given and we do not have enough copies of the B cell, then it is possible that when the actual infection occurs, we do not have enough number of sleeping B cells or memory B cells that can get up and start functioning within 24 hours. And they may still need to kind of keep going for some more time to become active or to become potent enough. But B cell will be formed during this time. Now, the second part of your question that how long the antibodies are going to stay. And these B cells, are some of them are going to become memory B cells, correct? These memory B cells will, in the beginning, release IgM and IgG. They would class switch to IgA as well. And what we have seen is that for two, three months, they continue to do that. Then uh, if you don't poke them again, if they don't see that antigen again, then their levels, their function reduces and they kind of go to sleep. Now, if at some point the actual infection occurs, so let's say the infection occurs or the second dose comes in, then these memory B cells will wake up. They'll, they'll open their eyes and they'll say, oh, I see this antigen once more. And they would start becoming proliferated once more. And then they would start making antibodies and then they would ramp up the antibody production. Now, this is tested with 14 days after the second dose or seven days after the second dose. And the second dose is 21 days later or a month later. So anywhere from 31 days to 44 days. This process is not tested for, let's say, three months later. Now, if we just look at it technically, three months later, these B cells would still be present. When actual infection occurs or the booster dose is given, these B cells will become triggered, they will become proliferated, and they would start functioning and increasing their activity. So ideally, any time after 7 to 14 days, that may be... Um, that may be, let's say, 20 days later, or that may be three months later, these B cells should be available. The I always qualify this thing with the following, that between the dose one, between the dose one and dose two, if the patient's immune system's status changes, if the patient becomes immunosuppressed, if they take drugs for immunosuppression, if they get an organ transplant, if they get a bone marrow transplant, if they get some kind of a chemotherapy radiation, that can actually cause issue because now their immune system is compromised. So then there is a different problem to solve. Otherwise, generally within two, three months, the B cells are not going to go away. So it would work. The problem is that from the dose one, between the dose one and let's say three months later, there is a long time, which is the risky time where infection can occur. And the efficacy is only anywhere from 52% to UK folks are claiming 70%. So that means you have reduced the chance of protecting by 50%. Now, for a large population that is under stress at this time, this may be the right approach. And this may actually be an issue as well. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, cool bean number 30, 381. Would you please explain a carrier of a disease? How and why does a person becomes a carrier? How long will they do be a carrier? That is a very, very interesting question. And <laughs> two answers. Let me give you the shorter answer. We actually do not know how people become carriers. We, we do not know why some people don't have symptoms and others have symptoms, or why some people actually have the virus in them and their tissues are not destroyed by it. There are some theories. For example, it is possible 
that the viruses are going to actually sit down in the macrophages. Just like now we are talking about the monocyte for the long haulers. We are saying that it is possible that the virus sits in the monocyte. Monocyte then becomes a macrophage. In other diseases, what we have seen is that let's say if we make a macrophage here. So this is a macrophage. Right? So ideally, he should be a scary dude and all pathogens should be afraid of him. So here is a macrophage. Macrophage's job is that if you trigger it, if you disturb it, if you connect an antigen with its tall like receptors, so this is called tall like receptor. So the pathogens, the viruses and bacteria and fungus and other things, they have PAMPs on them, pathogen associated molecular patterns that are recognized by the tall like receptors and that allow the macrophage to become mad and pick up that pathogen and destroy it. So we call that a pro-inflammatory response of the macrophage. There are some pathogens known. So we don't know that about SARS-CoV-2. There are some pathogens known that when they get into the macrophage, they change the macrophage's behavior. They ask it to become anti-inflammatory instead of pro-inflammatory. They change its behavior to the reverse of it. So all of a sudden, this macrophage that was going to attack the system or the pathogen and the other cells as part of the immune response, it actually becomes anti-inflammatory. It starts telling everyone, hey, guys, don't worry. Don't do anything. We are fine. No need to fight. Just go calm down. We are fine. And that allows the pathogen to continue to live in that macrophage and in other cells. So this is a conversion of the immune system's behavior from one extreme to the other extreme. And now the beneficiary is the pathogen itself. So that is something that has been observed with other pathogens. This may be the case with SARS-CoV-2 as well. So that is the carrier state's possible explanation. Medicine actually does not know exactly how carrier states occur. So that was a very good question. So I'm going to look at the um, live side here. How is everyone doing? <laughs> Ray says, Dr. Bean doodles well, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Um, so there is a question from PKT, PKT. Question, ivermectin and spike protein attachment, a problem with messenger RNA vaccines? So I just talked about it. Uh, generally, no. But um, if you can just rewind this video a little bit later on, you can actually see that ivermectin will not disrupt a vaccine. So Ridge Runner says, if someone has recovered from COVID, are they then safe to have in your home? Depends how long have they recovered. Ideally, so again, the answers are data-based and uh, then the answer is uh, clinical. So the data answer is that if they have a negative RT-PCR twice in a row from two different places, then they are clear. Clinical answer is that if their symptoms have, have gone, then 10 to 15 days after the symptom, usually they are not shedding anymore. But this, again, does not mean if they were carriers or not. So ideally, if somebody had COVID and has recovered clinically, and then they have recovered through RT-PCRs as well, then they are fine. Uh, if they have recovered clinically, we do not have RT-PCR, then 10 to 15 days after the clinical recovery, normally they are not shedding. However, 10, uh, 59 days after, up to 59 days after the clinical recovery, it is possible that they may be shedding the virus in fecal route. So if, for example, somebody visits you, they go to the restroom, and if the restroom is not cleaned correctly, or if there is vapor from the flushing, that can be a possible risk, which is mostly in the uh, public places as well. But that is the only one known risk. Although there are studies that say that the virus that is shedded in the fecal route after the active disease is usually not contagious. It is kind of in, in non-viable virus, but it is just sitting in the gut cells and it is being thrown out. So that is the overall. If you ask me, 
somebody who had COVID and become uh, has recovered and there is 10, 15 days since they recovered, I will be fine having them with me. Good question. Debbie Boss, uh, Debbie Boss says, Debbie, welcome back. I've seen you after a long time. Viruses can suppress macrophages by increasing naglase enzyme interferon inducers and as well macrophages activators combat this. Correct. And the interferon gamma are the kind of things that activate the macrophages. The question is that can one reverse the function and there is known that some viruses and pathogens can do it. Uh, M. Gregory says, question, is it safe to visit my friend's newborn baby? I never tested or feel sick. So that's a difficult question. Um, newborn babies up to one year of age are more susceptible to catching the infection and becoming sick compared to one year to nine year. So one year to nine year actually are much more uh, stronger to take care of the virus, but below one year of age, the newborn's immune system is not mature enough to be able to combat the virus. So they are actually at risk. That is one. Secondly, um, if you are actually healthy, then going and meeting them with the proper protocol, it depends, um, is fine as well. Um, I have actually had a couple of friends that had babies, uh, friends or team members of Dr. Bean. I did not go there. Although I know I'm healthy, but I still did not go there because it's just, um, it didn't feel right to me. Maybe they think that, hey, he may be sick and now, you know, we have a newborn child. So my thinking was that way. So I did not go. I actually did video calls and, and send gifts. Um, so the uh, Gunnar fan hand says, what is the problem with the focus today? Can it be fixed? Is it the focus of my video because that camera is different or the screen is not in focus either? So there is a, I saw a question from Bergerin. Question, can you pull together data and make a video about the roadmap to vaccination? Uh, Bergerin, can you elaborate a little more? Because uh, I have been uh, talking about the vaccine for some time. There's a question from Shahida. Oxford AstraZeneca is available, offered two doses to be taken at two weeks interval. I've asked them to give me the relevant papers. Would you take it? So um, the only thing with the As Oxford AstraZeneca is that how is it made? I am fine with it. So if it is offered two doses to be taken at two weeks interval, um, they had tested AstraZeneca in their trial with four weeks and then up to three months interval. So they haven't tested it with two weeks interval. I would not take it with two week interval because the first dose may still be activating the immune system that then needs to be boosted with the second dose. So if I had to take it, I would take one dose and then at least three weeks later, I would take the second dose. Uh, David Palmieri says, if the mother is breastfeeding, that is a protection. If not breastfeeding, then non-protection for newborn. Um, so there is a qualifier over here. So let me explain this part. So what happens is a mother that is breastfeeding would, so let's say this is the mother, she would actually transmit IgA through the milk to baby, not IgG, IgA. IgA's function is to line the mucosal membrane. So when the child is going to have that milk, which has IgA, that would line the child's GIT system and protect their intestine. 
So that is good, not bad. However, the question is that does the mother have antibodies against this virus? It is not that mother's antibodies would protect the baby from all diseases. Most of the time she has given him enough kind of antibodies that that gives immunity to child for many, many diseases. But if mother never had SARS-CoV-2, which is the case in many cases, uh, if she never had the SARS-CoV-2, then she would not have the IgAs to SARS-CoV-2, then she would not give it to the baby for SARS-CoV-2. So baby is actually not protected. Uh, if mother had SARS-CoV-2, and then it depends if she was pregnant and had SARS-CoV-2, then she may have given IgG to baby through the placental route and the baby would keep that from anywhere a few weeks to six months. If mother had the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and her breast milk has IgA to SARS-CoV-2, then that would give some protection for the GIT part, which is important because SARS-CoV-2 is going to go through the respiratory system and that includes the mouth and pharynx and then the respiratory system. So that gives baby some protection with that IgA. But that has to be that antibodies arrive in the baby from the mother. And if mother doesn't have those antibodies, then protection is not there. OK. <clears throat> So um, Adnan Arshad says, do you have any information? Will Pakistan get Pfizer or Moderna vaccine? Or uh, we have to get Sinopharm or CanSino, which are more likely to be available here in Pakistan. It is safe to get in trial. So the um, I don't think that Pakistan is going to get Moderna or Pfizer because I've been talking with many healthcare facility administrators, and my friends are some of the top doctors there as well, and I've talked with them. Uh, nobody is actually talking with Pfizer or Moderna. At least that's what I, I know that nobody is. Maybe there are some people. Now, CanSino and others are being trialed over there. I have actually asked some of my friends to get into that trial. Uh, one thing that is interesting in Pakistan is that you can go get your antibody test without a prescription. So those who went into trial, I did ask them to after three, four weeks to get their antibody tests to see if they were given a placebo or the vaccine itself. And so I think CanSino or other Chinese uh, vaccines are possibly the ones. AstraZeneca may be the one. What I had heard was that uh, when AstraZeneca was requested by Pakistani authorities, the manufacturing facility in India had refused it. They said that we have a billion dose need within India we cannot give you the vaccine. So I think AstraZeneca is off the table. Moderna is already nobody's talking with them from Pakistan. Pfizer, nobody's talking with them. So some Chinese vaccines would be the one. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the super sticker and super chat. Uh, question, does a newborn have ACE2 receptors? Yes, they do, but the number is less. Even children up to 12, 13, 14 years, their ACE2 receptors, even up to 18, 19 years, their ACE2 receptor numbers are less. Good question. I've, I've done this discussion in detail in the children and SARS-CoV-2 video for why they are better protected. Uh... Priya, you're most welcome. Uh, Dave Nelly says, is there an increased risk of mutation by initially allowing only one shot of the vaccine? This is the UK vaccination policy and now seems to be the US strategy also. Many thanks. So Dave, I think I should do a, a one discussion on delayed second dose because it's a very common uh, question. I just responded to that a few minutes ago as well. Uh, it really depends for, on two things. One is the trial data. So look, when we have a when we have a drug to be used, normally the approval for the use comes from the trial data. And you do the trial and you say, here is the data, and then based on that data, you say, all right, here is the drug to be 
used. When we are delaying the dose, we are actually going against the trial data. We are doing something that for which we do not have the data. Because of that, these companies, Pfizer's Modern, are saying, all bets are off. We do not know what you're going to end up with. Now, if you look at technical side, the scientific part of it, I just explained it. From a scientific part, it is actually OK to delay the vaccine because the immune system will get boosted when the second dose is given. The, the risk part, effectivity part, is that during the, two, the, during the gap between the two doses, the person's protection level is lesser than if they had gotten the two doses at the right time. So that is a problem. And the protection level is about 50%. Although UK now, because they're trying to uh, say that this is OK, they are saying there is protection is 70%. So what they are saying is that if we have a lots of doses of the vaccine, why not we just give it to a lot of people? And then that would give 70% advantage that they are protected. Less people would become severe. Less deaths would occur. And then the second dose can come later. My wonder, What I wonder is this. Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, they have promised to produce billions of doses. And they have promised to give millions of doses. UK's population is not so much to say that a few million doses or 10 or 20 million doses are somehow not available to give to the most at-risk population. So I do not know what is, what is causing that decision making. For example, if they say, well, we have 20 million doses. And let's just give it the, as the first dose. Are they afraid that in next four weeks or six weeks, they would not have another 20 million doses? That will be sad because these companies are supposed to produce billions of doses in quarter one and quarter two. So um, technically, it is OK. Protection wise, it is not that great. And from data point of view, it is not great at all. But I'll do a separate discussion about this as well. So uh, there is a question. I just looked at it and it scrolled. So here it is. Uh, Rizzo Bit says, please, please, please also let us know about the antibody dependent enhancement uh, with only one vaccine. I have discussed this many, many times. So uh, Rizzo Bit, if you can look at some of my previous videos, antibody dependent enhancement is a theoretical concept. It has been observed very, very rarely and mostly in the in vitro studies where specific environment is produced for the cell that they can behave in a way that they can cause antibody dependent enhancement. The, the point is this. Let me just draw it. What we are saying is that here is, let's say this is a cell and that got, gets some kind of an antigen, some antigen, SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein or something. And this cell, in turn, causes the immune system to become active, which is innate arm and the adaptive arm, correct? The immune system becomes active and it starts making antibodies. Now, these antibodies, the objection or the fear of ADE is the following. <coughs> Excuse me. Here is the fear. And again, this is seen in, in vitro. This is not something that has been observed very commonly. So it is not a practical problem. It is more of a theoretical concept. So here is what happens. You have the antibodies now, correct? Now let's say in this person's body, the actual virus arrives, right? So when the virus arrives in this person's body, Virus has those antigens as well that you had given with the vaccine. The virus is going to attach to the some cells, respiratory system cells, and those cells will then present the spike protein on their surface, and the same immune system will be told that, hey, immune system, I've gotten this antigen. 
an immune system is going to say, well, I know about this antigen. I have actually training to beat this antigen. So within 24 hours, instead of 7 or 15 or 20 days, within 24 hours, immune system is going to start making lots and lots of antibodies. So far, so good. Those antibodies are going to attack the virus and try to kill it and all that. Here is the concept of ADE. The concept is that when an antibody is connected with the pathogen, the benefit of releasing the antibody is that antibodies are going to coat the pathogen. They are, if this is, if you, if my hand is the pathogen, the antibodies are going to come and attach all over it and they would just try to neutralize it. And they say, the scientific community says, that let's say here is a macrophage. Macrophages, other cells as well, like mast cell, dendritic cell, they have a specific receptor for this side of the antibody. The FC portion, and antibodies are called to have various parts. One part of the antibody is called the FC part. The macrophages have a receptor for the FC part of the antibody. And why is that? Macrophages can actually trap an antibody and allow the antibody to settle on its surface. And then the antibodies can do a lot of things that macrophage would work with. One of the outcome is that the macrophage can actually pull this antibody in it. Now imagine, so here is the problem. Now imagine with the antibody is tied is SARS-CoV-2. This SARS-CoV-2, if it wanted to get into the cell, it originally, it just needed an ACE2 receptor. But now it can actually just connect with an antibody that we have already produced against it. And now it can get into the cell through one more route. And that is the FC receptor as well. So in theory, you are now offering more kind of routes for the virus to enter the cell. That is what is called antibody dependent enhancement. If you complete this sentence, what they're saying is antibody dependent enhancement of the viral entry into the cell. What is not said most often, so when people are trying to scare you, they'll say, you know that there is ADE and that is going to happen with the vaccine and so we are in trouble. What they don't tell you is the following. <clears throat> the macrophage, once it eats up this thing, it gets into a vesicle. It's not just brought in willy-nilly to run around in the cytoplasm free. This whole thing is brought in in a, in a vesicle. This part of the cell membrane pinches in. This is called phagocytosis or pinocytosis, correct? Depending upon the size of the pinch. It is pinched in and it is closed on the virus. So the when the antibody is gone in and the virus is attached to it, this whole thing is captured in a tiny prison. And then there are lysosomes in the cell, especially in the macrophages. These lysosomes are tiny stomach with the acids in them. They are fused with this vesicle. The, the acids are released onto this antibody and onto the virus. They digest them, they break them down, and then the, the uh, macrophage is going to present that antigen on its surface. So if you look at this mechanism, the only enhancement you would see here is presentation is increased. Macrophage is now presenting that virus more than normally because if this was just the ACE2, then the virus would have to enter the cell through the ACE2 and that would be presented. And now we have one more route through which the virus can get it and get in and present it. So uh, I'll add one more uh, concept here. When the immune system, so if I go here, when the immune system, where was it? So somewhere over here I had drawn it. 
when the immune system causes the activation so let's make it this way so let's say this is a macrophage and this is the t helper t helper 1 cells so this is naive t cell they are connected here this is t helper 2 b cell this is t helper 1 cytotoxic t cell right these are the pathways T helper cell one releases, T helper one releases interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is supposed to activate a macrophage. And what does that mean? That means that if a macrophage was going to eat up one pathogen in a minute, now it is going to eat up 100 pathogens in a minute. That is called macrophage activation. That is also called, it would cause enhancement in presentation as well. So this concept that somehow vaccine will prime our body to get into ADE con uh, problem is actually not very accurate. It is a theoretical possibility, but our body has other amplification mechanisms to present the virus more. When the virus is present in our body, it is going to get attached to some cell. It is going to get into the cell. So you don't need just the vaccines uh, antibodies to enhance it, it can itself get into our body as well, our cells with ACE2. It has no lack of ACE2 that it needs a new route. So I hope that answers that question. Um, let's see here. We are unfair to Twitter folks for some days now. Um, so that is answered. Tony, this is a good question. So Tony has a question about the um, the 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin. So Tony, what I'll do is I'll do a separate topic about this one. This is an important topic. Uh, the, the gist of the question here from Tony Karalikas is that the patients who have inflammatory disorder, for example, cytokine storm, there is a Dr. Farid Jalali and I have put his uh, uh, tweet link in the description as well. So you can please go and read it. So he he is saying that it is the increased serotonin that is causing the inflammatory reactions and cytokine storms. So, Tony, what I'll do is, as a mechanism with serotonin, I would discuss it. Although there is a thing that is lacking in there, and that is that serotonin levels do not increase in everyone. The question is, do they increase in everyone who develops a cytokine storm? That is something that I have to first study and look for that data before I can say uh, Dr. Farid Jalali is correct or he has a gap. But this was a very interesting thing. This is my kind of concept to look at. Mirror 91 says, meta-analysis shows that ivermectin is powerful in prophylaxis and in late phase. How is it possible in early treatment achieve only a mean 30% improvement? How is possible in early treatment to achieve only a mean 30% improvement? Uh, Mirror. I do not know. Are you talking about the improvement by Iver Ivermectin and only 30%? If that is the case, can you share some data with me? Uh, COVID LT says, while there may be no easy way to detect viral persistence, any good heuristics one can use, QT, for example, second question, short burst of 40 to 50 milligram steroid versus low dose for long pros cons. Uh, so I have been doing short bursts. I talked about it. <clears throat> low dose, long time is great as well. Low dose, long time, if your body can take it, meaning immunosuppression and any other issues, low dose is not usually a problem. It can be taken. And by long time, two, three, four months, it should not be an issue. 40, 50 milligram pulses. I actually give pulses with 15 milligram and then taper them. And that works very well as well. But has to be done early on in the... Uh, disease. Now the <clears throat> second part here, uh, any heuristics for detecting where the virus is. So in my opinion, finding the virus is first to look at the cytokines that are triggered by this virus. So for example, we know that this virus causes macrophage activation syndrome. We know that this virus causes bradykinin storm. We know that this causes cytokine storm, which is because of the macrophage activation syndrome. So what I would do is that if I was looking at things, I would take some, for some patients, 
I would take their lymph biopsy and I would look at their T cell levels, their B cell levels, almost at a research. You cannot do it at scale, just for some patients. I'll do their lymph node biopsy. I look at their type of cells. Maybe they are a long hauler, and I look at the kind of cells there and their reactivity with the SARS-CoV-2. And from the blood point of view, I would look at their labs for interleukin-6 and 2. So I'll do cytokine profiles. So based on those profiles, I would know which cells are not working correctly or are overactive. Then I'll go and hunt for those cells from the lymph node biopsy or from the bone marrow or from the blood cultures to see what's wrong with them. Are they just reacting? If they are reacting, then the virus is sitting somewhere or immune system is not regulated. If immune system is not regulated, then I would go for T helper 17 cells and see what is wrong with the T helper 17 cells. Why are they continuously um, failing to suppress the immune system? If the T helper 17 cells are fine, then I would look at cells, for example, from gut or cells from the respiratory system. For example, I will take bronchoalveolar lavage. And in those cells, I would see if the virus is still present. I would take fecal matter and do a stool test to see if the virus is still present in there. I would do blood culture to see the virus is present there. And in extreme cases, which I think is not necessary, a bone marrow culture to see um, if the virus is still there. This, is, this has to be done in some sort of a rigorous study but has to be led by the labs. Labs would tell you which cells are abnormal. Then you look at the cells. If they seem to be fine, then you start hunting where the virus is sitting. Good question. So I'm going to go to the live side and see what's happening here. Um, yes, I had some folks that I needed to block. Uh, some folks had told me if I see them, I'll block them. Nina, please tell me who is bothering you, and I'll see if I should block them. Uh, <clears throat> so overdressed, does cytokine storm happen for both men and women equally, or one is more vulnerable than the others? So one, we generally know that women are half as likely to become severe as men. But both genders do become cytokine stormed. And I think there are more reasons for cytokine storm than this, but gender difference is this. Michaeli says, Tulsi Gabbard said, CDC is politicizing distribution. I do not know what their motives are. They are so incompetent. If this is because they are politicizing it, that is criminal. But they're just so incompetent. Look at this, that we were supposed to have 20 million doses done by the first week of the um, uh, January. It was first supposed to be end of December and then first week of January. So if I go to Bloomberg uh, vaccine dashboard, It is income. Look at this. So we are at 10th day of January. And we have 7.73 million doses being given. At this rate, we're not going to get a vaccine for the whole year. Although in the beginning, I was a little more patient with this to say, you know what, they are still learning how to distribute and how to give it. So it's a slow moving train. And as it would accelerate, it would just go fast. But you know that there are uh, folks there are centers where the vaccine is present and people are not getting it. And so they are giving it to others, general public. So this is just weird. 22 million doses distributed, 7.7 .7 million doses administered. So now it is a um, logistics issue. It is incompetence. It is politics. I don't know, but the outcome is not right. So I just saw one more uh, super chat. Thank you very much. Um, block Kevin. OK. Where is Kevin?
Kevin. Let me find him. Here. <laughs> Kevin says, my favorite pastime is spreading COVID-19. I've had it first time since March. They shot me up with fitting and sent me home to die. Okay. <clears throat> All right, blocked. Overdress, you're welcome. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very good question from Thrill. Can people get reinfected if they had um, if they had COVID and were treated with monoclonal antibodies? Thanks. <clears throat> good question. And here is the reason why I say this is a good question. Let me draw it. So let's say there is a person here, and this person. <laughs> now you know how I draw persons. <laughs> this is how I draw a person. So here is a person. The person is given, uh, got SARS-CoV-2, right? Not given, they got infected by SARS-CoV-2. Now their body is going to make the antibodies. If they have reached a point to give monoclonal, now the question is the following. Are they being given monoclonal antibody because they are some sort of a hot shot? For example, we saw Regeneron to be given to Trump or to Rudy Giuliani, and they came out two days later. They were fine. So is it because they are some sort of important people or uh, above us people? And if that is the case, how quickly was it given? Was it given when they developed the uh, breathing issues? If that is the case, they have developed their normal antibodies. We are now trying to remove the virus so that the cytokine storm does not occur. With that, we are going to cause the cytokine storm to suppress as well. So in such patient, do they have the antibodies? Yes, they have the antibodies. Their immune system is actually more reactive than others. Similarly, if it is monoclonal or poly polyclonal, it depends if they got it because of this. That's one. Second is imagine that there is another person who cannot make antibodies. They're immunosuppressed or they're given chemotherapy or some other immunosuppressants and they're not or they have organ transplant or bone marrow transplant and they're not. Their immune system is not up to the mark. And you have given them monoclonal antibodies. In this case, it is possible that their own immune system may not be able to make the, uh, the antibodies quick enough and in the right amounts. And they may need further uh, treatments or protections. And then uh, a third possibility is where a person received the monoclonal antibodies, normal healthy person who was going to take care of it, but they also receive the monoclonal antibody as a prevention. For example, let's say I work in a hospital and I'm given monoclonal antibodies to kind of protect me for 30, 40 days. In that case, when the virus would arrive in my body, my monoclonal antibodies that are sitting in my blood, which are passive in immunity, would attack it and hopefully take care of it. That means the infection may or may not be able to create enough potent immune response and then I may be at risk or may not be at risk. So that data is actually not present. So there are three types of uh, scenarios. So good question. Catherine, thank, thank you very much for your super chat. Um, what else? The <laughs> Twitter folks are going to kill me because I have not answered lots of questions there. Um, Adnan Arshad asks this question, I think, many times. Are, uh, sir, are there Chinese vaccines safe to get if you have fatty liver or cholesterol-related issues? I heard private facilities like Chukai Lab will improve, import Pfizer vaccine in Pakistan. So I know I had done a TV interview as well where there are some private companies that are trying to get the Pfizer's or Moderna, but I do not know if that is true or not or when will that happen. Having said that, um, fatty liver or cholesterol issue 
should not be a bigger issue uh, to take the vaccines. It is really the immune system status that is more important. <laughs> Francis, we in the live chat are hogging Dr. Bean again. Yes. And I think the Twitter folks are going to become upset. Jim, hospitals don't want to give Regeneron because it ties up hospital space. Mm -hmm. Debbie Boss, are, are you aware that a large number of long haulers are getting re-exposed and getting sick again, reporting same pattern as the first time and worse? Do you think that the immune suppression of the long haulers not reversing is possible? So <clears throat> if a long hauler is in immunosuppressed state, for example, they're getting steroids, then of course their body is not going to react that correctly. And it also depends how much steroids are they getting. So that's one. Secondly, if the long hauler is a long hauler because their immune system's response is actually weak and the virus has a free reign in their body to just live. So immune system is decent enough to not let it make it severe, but not potent enough to kill the virus. Then they can get reinfected and get the uh, virus can once again overwhelm them. So it is possible to get the reinfection if the reason is something to do with the immune system's uh, suppression. And that may be artificial by steroids from outside, or that may be because of their own immune system. On the other hand, it is also possible that long hauling is because of the overactive immune system that has forgotten to calm down. In such a patient, if you introduce a virus again, just like the second dose of the vaccine at the wrong time, that might actually boost it and say, all right, work more and the immune system would cause even more uh, issues. So interesting concept. Uh, I, I have been for, I think, a couple of months, I have been saying to myself that one whole week should only go in discussing long hauler and researching. And I have never gotten a chance because the things are developing so fast. <clears throat> Nina Superchat, thank you very much. Uh, Nabu says, a killed inactivated vaccine like Covaxin, Bharat Biotech, isn't better than a messenger RNA-based vaccine which has only a spike protein and as an antigen. You are correct. So the short answer is correct. And let me explain the long answer here. <clears throat> So what Nabu is saying is that if we have an, a killed virus, so I know whenever I'll say killed, there would be so many comments by medical science students and others who would say, how can you say killed? The virus is already killed. So it is a loose term to use, means inactivated virus or not viable virus. So let's say here is a SARS-CoV-2 and this is the virus and it is an active virus. What you do is you treat it with some chemicals to kind of cause a little bit of damage to it. So break it down. And now there are pieces of the virus, broken pieces, just like if you break a glass and the glass is now all shattered and sitting on the floor, all the pieces are there, but they're all shattered. They cannot act like a glass anymore. So that is what you have done. You have killed the virus or inactivated the virus by kind of breaking it up into smaller pieces. Those pieces are then injected in the, um, in the muscle, let's say deltoid muscle. Now the question that Nabu is saying is, isn't this actually better because when the body would receive so many kinds of antigens, not just a spike protein, body or immune system, is going to make antibodies against this part and then the spike protein and then the M protein and the RNA and so many types of spike protein uh, antibodies will be formed. So when there are so many kinds of antibodies and the actual virus arrives, our body would attack it in so many ways. So Nabu, in theory, you are correct. That we would have a polyclonal response 
to the whole virus or a majority piece of the virus, and we would just coat it as soon as it comes in, and we would start attacking it everywhere. The second part of the answer is that spike protein-based antibodies are good enough as well because we neutralize the virus as soon as it comes in. This is like if you say that, hey, I want to capture a person, and I'm going to hold. I don't want them to, let's say, um, throw punches. And so I'm going to hold their legs, and I'm going to hold their trunk, and I'm going to hold their arms, and I'm going to hold their hands, and I'm going to hold their head. Versus all you want is that they should not throw punches. So you put something on their hand and lock it. And now they, they're, for example, the cuffs. And so now they cannot do anything. So in case of the spike proteins vaccine as well, effectivity should be similar to the inactivated virus. But you're correct that with inactivated virus, we would have a bigger menu of antibodies to attack it. Good question. That is correct. So, uh, Paul, my assumption in this discussion, so your, your answer, your comment is correct. My assumption in this discussion is that the virus, inactivated virus that is brought in, has the spike proteins as well. So that means our immune system will be trained against the spike protein plus other parts of the virus. While with the spike protein vaccine, just the spike protein part. I would I would think that they would behave equally good. You're welcome. <clears throat> Machiavelli says a, a broken vessel will not won't hold water. Me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Machiavelli. Um, wow, so there is a question from Periscope as well. So we are for the first time on Periscope. So Mark Zappa says, well, not Mark Zuckerberg. Do you see patients with significant infection are vaccinated? They have worse vaccine reactions. Do you see patients with significant infection who are vaccinated? So Mark, I'll have to, if you're talking about the reaction because of the vaccine, I have promised yesterday that I would look into the deaths that are occurring and talk about it. I have talked about the Pfizer and Moderna based reactions before as well. Um, I didn't catch the question very well. So my apologies if you can please elaborate. More super chats. Bambi, secret, thank you. Awaiting allergy testing to see if allergic to steroid injection, would you shield forever to avoid COVID and delay vaccine in case of allergic reaction? <clears throat> Why would you be allergic to steroid injection? Uh, with that, would you shield forever to avoid COVID and delay vaccine in case of allergic reaction? Shield forever to avoid COVID? Uh, Bambi, um, I am not able to catch the second part of your question in case of allergic reaction. So let's say some, I'm going to answer what I thought is the question. Please, uh, if you can um, say if I, I was correct or not in understanding it. If you have an allergic reaction to the vaccine, then the second dose is not allowed. The first dose would create enough immunity that there is some protection. Now the question, the question is legitimate, just like right now with the long haulers. There is a legitimate question that now what do we do for folks like that? Hopefully what would happen is that the remaining part of the society would start becoming um, uh, part of the herd immunity, eventually saving and protecting these folks as well. And it is also possible that these folks would be given, for example, they are reacting to polyethylene glycol. So don't give them the second dose of polyethylene glycol. That means Moderna or Pfizer. Give them maybe AstraZeneca or maybe give them CanSino or some other drug. So it is possible to, to give a dose of a different kind of a vaccine. <clears throat> so... 
So um, overdressed says, Doctor, how how often does the infected person can transmit during the incubation period, even if they don't show symptoms? So I had done this discussion very much earlier. The study said that the person, let's say the mean time for the uh, mean time for the symptom is 5.1 days, correct? They saw that the person becomes maximally contagious two days before. So before that, the person really transmits less. But two days before developing the symptom, but the person is shedding equal to or almost equal to when they would shed with the symptoms. And here is the reason to actually logically understand it. Let's say I have the infection today and I don't have the symptom. That means the virus has not caused enough damage and not activated enough immune system to cause any tissue damage and I don't have symptoms. If let's say tomorrow I'm going to get symptoms, it is not a switch in my body that is just going to turn on. If I'm going to get these symptoms tomorrow, that means today there is sufficient amount of virus as well that is caused enough damage as well that it is present in my um, respiratory system and it is shedding. So a couple of days before the symptoms, the shedding starts, which is good enough amount to make others sick. <clears throat> so So Eric says that any further thoughts on the use of famotidine as part of the protocol? I love famotidine. It has a beautiful action. So I just stick to it. So Gaurav says, sir, all over the world, cases are increasing, but in India, cases are reducing. Do you think India has herd immunity uh, before vaccine? I think India may have herd immunity, but that may be a difficult thing to achieve, 60-70% of the infection rate or infection. The possibility is that the doctors have learned to give ivermectins and steroids and hydroxys and others. I've seen some of the packaging that India has offered to their people, which includes ivermectin. So I think that there is uh, aggressive early treatments, number one. Number two, I have lots of friends from India as well. And uh, they talk about the prophylaxis and they talk about the vitamin Ds. So I think there is a lot of uh, um, understanding that there needs to be supplements and secondly, there is aggressive early treatment available without a lots of hoopla or, or taboo like in US or Europe. Because of that, I believe people are in better off positions. I don't think herd immunity for a billion, two billion, three people, that's a lot of number to develop herd immunity. Okay, so... <clears throat> Absolutely. Aggressive early treatment is the answer. Um, Gongi, <laughs> thank you very much for the super chat. The spike protein is 78.4% human-like epitope. Isn't autoimmunity a risk in all of the vaccines since they all have as antigen whole spike protein? Uh, why do you say that is 78.4% human-like epitope? Can you give me some reference? Because uh, if it is human-like epitope, then the question is which tissue? For example, is it cross-reacting with cardiac tissue, which is one thought? Do you have any link that I can see for what other tissues? And <clears throat> even if it cross-reacts with the cardiac tissue, most of the time the virus gets caught by our immune system before it can actually create enough antibodies that are going to go and attack the heart. But... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I have not seen 
human tissue mimicry by a spike protein. So I would need some sort of a link. So Gladys says, what is your early aggressive cocktail? So I am, this is how I treat nowadays. <clears throat> Although unfortunately many times the people who contact me have actually started reducing their oxygen and somebody says, you know what, you go find Mubin. Um, what I do is, number one in prophylaxis, I ask them to keep good vitamin D levels, take K2 with it, magnesium with it, um, and uh, copper with it if they can. With that, I always give quercetin and zinc. With that, I request people to take melatonin, but I don't insist on it. <clears throat> Um, vitamin C. Vitamin D I give in very high doses. Then if they are sick, I immediately put them on ivermectin. Zinc and quercetin, I usually not combine hydroxychloroquine and or ivermectin. My way of treatment has shifted from hydroxy and zinc to hydroxy plus ivermectin and zinc to ivermectin only because I found ivermectin to be much more rapid in its effect, safe, and with less side effects compared to hydroxy. So with ivermectin, I give them um, some antibiotic as well so that they do not get super infections or secondary infections. Six or seven days in their <clears throat> disease, depending upon their age, I usually add steroids as well. If they are oxygen levels are 93, 94 in that range. And the reason I do that is that I want to prevent them from becoming long haulers, or I want to prevent them from immediately tipping over and becoming stuck with a cytokine storm. And I have hoped that by seven, 10 days, the immune system had enough chance to activate its cells and the B cells are working and the T cells are working. So immune system is doing its function. And now my job is switched from providing the help against the virus to making sure that the immune system does not get dysregulated. So that is how I do it. Um, fortunately, so far, none of my patients that started with me earlier have ended up in the hospital. So I have not had to consult them when they are in the hospital to say, do this or that. This is a touch word, um, I'm blessed that this has not happened. There have been so far <clears throat> in my circles or in the folks who have contacted me, there have been some deaths. For example, there has been my friend's brother who died in New York. Um, I found out when he had severe oxygen deprivation and he was taken to the emergency room they never gave him ivermectin or those things. In those days, even other things were not known yet. So these were early times. He uh, stayed on the ventilator for months and then he passed away. That is one case. Uh, there are a couple of other cases as well where I was not the consultant, but they were very close to me and then um, they passed away. So there is one case uh, this person is a cool bean. His mother was uh, not doing well. And <clears throat> by the time I jumped in to try to help, um, we we had to first convince the doctors for ivermectin. They made fun of us. And then finally, they did start the ivermectin. She did improve a little bit, but then she took a turn again for the worst. So that is one case where um, even after ivermectin, the person was uh, not recovered. <clears throat> so uh, it looks like the the Twitter site. So let's look at it. COVID LTV were here. Where um, Robbie Burton is one seventy trial participants contracting COVID-19 out of 44,000, really indicative of 90%, 95% efficacy. It doesn't sound like the virus was particularly prevalent. <clears throat> uh, Robbie, you are correct. 
if you look at it that out of 44,000, how many people did become uh, sick? This is how vaccine or comparative studies are done with preventive drugs. This is how we match it. We say, all right, two groups are given drugs. Larger the group, the better it is. Then you see, compared to each other, what is the incidence rate of the disease? So yes, you can say overall, the number of patients who are really low. The question that I have is, overall, a society of 44,000 people, what is the rate in them? And I do not know the answer. So normally, just the, the best they can do is to just compare them to each other. And that is how this comparison is. So you're correct. You can say that, hey, the number of patients uh, that were patients were so low that I don't want to believe it. But still, the significance was that the uh, drug arm was 95% better in the number of patients compared to placebo arm. So that becomes statistically significant, so it is used. So uh, I'll, I have looked at this as well, and I totally agree with his point of view as well. Uh, I would do a little more detailed discussion. COVID US org, now that we have vaccines, is there a recent estimate on the herd immunity threshold as a percent of population? Absolutely. So I was actually very, very much looking forward to this number going up. My hope was that the vaccinated people's number would go up higher than the people who are getting infected. But even with this number, we know that uh, 22, 23 million people are infected. 7.725 million people are now given the vaccine as well. Although the first dose only, so I should not assume them protected, but let's say for our, our uh, theoretical discussion, we assume them to be protected fully. Then we have 22 million plus 7 million or 23 million plus 7 million. This is actually about 8 million. So we have about 30 million people who have become part of the herd immunity. Very few would have reinfections. So at least one third of the immunity or herd immunity, current herd immunity is 30 million out of 300 million or 328 million. So not significant yet. But out of them, one third is because of vaccine. And if I put it in the context, the 22 million became sick over one year. And the 10 million or 8 million that are getting vaccine is over three, four weeks. So that is the difference. So I would expect in another two, three weeks, another 10 million would get the vaccine. So that would become equal to the people who are getting infected and becoming part of the herd immunity. So vaccines would overtake their, their rate, which is a good thing. We don't want the infect people to, becoming, to become infected and uh, un unfortunately die. So vaccines would eventually take over and do better. But at this time, they are lagging a little bit. <clears throat> So this is a good question, Vic Arvi. I actually have the link and the discussion too as well. We are at two hours. I would continue with the Twitter side on Monday as well. And so let me uh, try to wrap up. Let's see here what's happening on the live side. Please don't mind folks on, on the Twitter. I'm trying to do my best, but I also don't want to just ignore questions. So I would reach to the remaining questions here on Monday. <clears throat> so Melanie Goodman says, are they still tracking the original 40,000 vaccine trial participants to see if they have con contracted COVID? Did they test everyone? So yes, they would continue to track them for, I think, about two years. Although there is a provision for those who got placebo to be told that you had the placebo and now you have a chance to get the vaccine. Uh, 
Um, Rizobit says, how do we know that the vaccine works if people only get half dose? People get sick and are excused as being not fully vaccinated. So Rizzo, in general, your question is, or your comment is correct, <clears throat> that we don't have the trial data for half dose only or one dose only. So we can't really say what would happen. I have gone over the Pfizer's and Moderna's data a couple of times for one dose. They say about 52% efficacy, but again, they say it's a small number because we have always been giving the second dose at the 21st day or the 28th day. So we actually do not know what would have happened. So that data is sparse. Maybe now that they are giving the vaccine to masses, maybe they would start collecting the data now. As much as I would protest to do that, technically they are fine to do it, but from a data point of view, they're not. <clears throat> Cool. Golmuk says, Dr. Bean doesn't realize he could answer questions for hours more on here. The biggest single failing of the West might be not giving their population enough information or prevention. I think that is a very important point. I was expecting that there would be, there would be on everything, you go to YouTube or you go to Twitter or you go to TV and there would be messages. Hey, guys, keep your vitamin D correct and your level should be this. And if you wanted to go get the test, do this. Have your supplements right. Eat correct food. Here are the things that you should eat. If you don't want supplements, take these foods like I did a healthy food plate. Uh, or if you can take supplements, do the following things or go talk with your doctor. There is nothing. You are correct. Yes, I can continue with the <laughs> answers. The prob problem is that it becomes, the video becomes very long. Robbie, you're most welcome. <clears throat> okay, so a couple of more questions and then we stop. <laughs> that is correct. And this should be told to everyone to take vitamin D. Closet Picker says, Dr. Bean, sadly, you are a rare light in the dark tunnel. Thank you. You are, you are very welcome. I actually think that we all did this together. Uh, I was looking at, I was thinking about it yesterday that my contribution was to research these things, apply the medical concepts, then come back here, sit down with all of us and kind of discuss it together. And then I had so much support as well, support in terms of love, support in terms of care, support in terms of uh, finances. I practically impacted my business uh, for one year now. And then I had so much um, uh, financial support as well. So. I think we were all together in it. Overdressed has a question that I've uh, uh, responded before. Overdressed, let me answer this again on Monday as well. Uh, just a quick gist of this. There are, there are duration issues. For example, Pfizer and Moderna. Moderna can be given 20 days later. So let's say you have to take a flight somewhere and you have to go and Moderna is a better choice because the duration of uh, giving the vaccine is compressed. There are some vaccines that are single dose, Johnson & Johnson, for example, or um, Novovax. So that may be useful. Then there are some folks who do not want to have a vaccine that was built in a fetal tissue copies. So that is AstraZeneca, or that is CanSino, or that is other adenovirus-based vaccine. So they would not take it, even if it is efficacious or not. 
then there are folks who are afraid of the messenger RNA vaccines because these are the first vaccines. So they say we don't want to take these because they are not traditionally built and we would rather prefer the traditional vaccines. In terms of efficacy, the most scared I am is of AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca's numbers are just scary for me. 62% here, 90% here, on average 70%. I am just not very much a fan of AstraZeneca. Moderna and Pfizer I like. Cool. So uh, <clears throat> one more question, Paul. So Paul Elkin says, Elkin says if an NNAB uh, antibody binds to a SARS-CoV-2 virion and it infects a cell via endocytosis, can the antibody be transported into the cytoplasm? If so, what will be the cell's immune response to that antibody? Nothing. Our cells digest these antibodies and eat them up. Our cells clear the immune complexes all the time. And even if most of the time it is sitting in the vesicle, and in that vesicle you pour the lysosome and just digest and destroy them, but even if that antibody goes into the cytoplasm, our cytoplasm is going to find the endosomes or other things to shred it and destroy it. The worst case, let's say, like a virus, there is so many antibodies in a, vi in a cell that the cell would be destroyed, but that's not going to happen. Good question. Catherine Daly says, I don't know how I found Dr. B in the first place, but I did in March apartment. Uh, thanks, goodness, I learned how to treat myself with the non-pharma when I did get it. I'm, I'm very happy for you, Catherine. Thank you very much for being a cool bean. So um, <clears throat> I think uh, we, should, we should take a break now for today. And tell me, uh, how did this new camera thing go? Did you like it? This is the... I had a DSLR camera for my normal photo shoot. So I just attached that to my computer. This is different from the webcam. Um, so Alex Jones Johnson has a question. Hi, Dr. Mubin. When do you expect the vaccine's effect to start reducing cases will begin? So <clears throat> at this time, of course, as it is going from tier to tier, the healthcare and residency uh, folks in the old home uh, care, they are getting it first. Healthcare folks were given PPEs and so they are relatively more protected, but the old age home or nursing home residents were making a very large percentage of the total deaths. So in terms of deaths, as soon as these four or five million folks are vaccinated, we'll have a drastic de decrease in number of deaths. Then as the vaccination continues to move forward, we'll have reduction in number of cases too. Now my hope is, and um, I have been so wrong whenever I talk about vaccine because I take them on the face value that they say, we will give vaccine to this many people at this time. And then it doesn't happen. Ideally this month, they should have vaccinated all the healthcare professionals that want to be vaccinated and all the nursing home residents that want to be vaccinated and come back and say, whoever wanted it, whoever was okay with it, we have given it, these two tiers are done. Now we're gonna go to the essential workers. If that happens by the end of this month, you would see a drastic reduction in the death rate. And then if the next month essential workers are done as well, then you would see a drastic reduction in the case rate as well. And then maybe a month later, our turn would appear. And I think ideally three, four months later, we should all be fine. But the death reduction you should see from this month, end of this month, case reduction you should start seeing by the end of next month. Nabu says, isn't it ideal to rule out COVID before getting vaccinated? They may be in pre-symptomatic phase. Yes. Or even if somebody has gotten the infection, for example, these 20 million people who became infected and now don't need the vaccine, so why to give them? Um, so yes, ideal, correct. But I think from a logistical point of view, they're not able to give the vaccine, administer the vaccine, if they are given the steps of logistics to say, first find a person who may 
ask the person if they had this disease before or not, and then do the antibody test and then decide if they should get the vaccine or not. They're just not going to be able to do that. So Dave says, I like the new camera. Thank you very much. So lying guys, I would talk about the nasal vaccine next week as well. <laughs> Rajesh Kisan, you are super. No camera can add anything more. Thank you very much. I love it. This is excellent. So Mark Zappa says, uh, my experience in Florida is about 50% healthcare workers vaccine. That is awesome. Alex, you're welcome. Cool. So uh, guys, do me a favor. Please, <laughs> this is my regular closing thing. I, so beautiful USA 3, I took hydroxychloroquine already. Should I take the vaccine? Yeah. Take the vaccine, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you very much for today. Uh, please do me a favor, like, subscribe, and share. Yes, it is a long video. You can just simply say, yeah, I know it is a long video, but listen to it anyways. And uh, there is a link for coffees in the description of this video. So if you wanted to buy me a coffee, please uh, use that video. And if you wanted to just support my work as well, there is another link in the description as well. So thank you very much. And I would see you on Monday. Tomorrow is my off. Bye-bye.